Good morning. Welcome to worship. Are you excited to be here today? Yes, it's a great day to be in God's house. Thank you if you're watching and joining us via live stream. We are welcoming you into our home this morning. We'd love to see you on campus. On campus, folks, let's stand to our feet. We're going to teach you a new song this morning. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Do you believe that this morning, church? There's nothing to fear now, for I'm safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. All right, you sing with us. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I'm safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the storm. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. You are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is the cross. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing 
Oh, just worship him, church. He deserves all the honor, all the glory. We come this morning just to say that we need you, Lord, more today than we've ever needed him. Lord, I
us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough. to honor you with our singing, our praying, Father, our studying of your word. God, may you be honored and may you be blessed today. God, we come into this place of broken people. Father, we need you more than we've ever needed you. So I pray today that our hearts would be open to hear from you. Father, to Give over our struggles to you and allow you to do what you do best. To fight our battles for us. Knowing we don't have to do that. Definitely don't have to do it alone, but we don't have to do that at all because you said you would do that for us. God, thank you for your mercy and your grace. Because it is new each and every day, and it sustains us. Father, it lifts us up. Continue to to live life according to the way you've designed it. Father, thank you for the plan that you've laid out for each of our lives. And I pray that we live in total surrender to you today. God, just watch you work. You ask us to join you where you're at work. God, you're at work in this place right now. Father, Holy Spirit, just continue to impress upon us. God, your power, your might, your goodness. We will give you all the glory all the honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Would you be seated? Just want to remind you, because we don't pass our offering plates, that there are boxes at at the entrances that you can place your physical sacrificial gift if you brought it today. Or you can go online, you can text to give. Download our church app and you have that ability to text to give. We've made it as easy as possible for you to continue to support the ministries here at First Baptist. Again, Mission 365, it's our dollar a day going towards our support of all our global 
partnerships, whether that be abroad, here in our community, throughout the state, and throughout the United States. And one of our partners over in Bosnia, Courtney and Sema, just had to relocate their ministry house. Well, they have found a place. And so our dollars help support them and their ministry to ladies and to children and to families in their city. So please, if you haven't started giving your dollar a day, start now. And let's continue to have an impact. We have four global partners out of our on church serving overseas, and we want to support them with everything we have, not only our prayer, but our dollars. Let's just continue to worship this morning. If you're hurting, if you've gone through loss recently, or maybe it's been several years, let Psalm 23, this, this arrangement, resonate in your heart mind today. And let's just continue to worship him. Will you do that with us? The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. He goes before me. Let's be 
close today, church. Yes. Yes, we praise him. <laughs> Hallelujah, we praise him. Thank you. You may be seated. Sometimes it's moments of brokenness which create the greatest transformations. Times where fear gives birth to faith, pain leads to healing, and chaos dissolves into peace. It's in these times we often see God more clearly. For in our deepest turmoil, He remains faithful. When our spirit is crushed, he remains strong. When our moment is too heavy, He carries the burden. As gold is refined by fire, we too are often refined by struggle. It's part of growing, changing, becoming. Lately, the journey has been difficult. Our breath has been labored. Our steps uneasy. But we stand in faith, knowing who is leading us through this desert. The God of peace, the God of hope, the God of restoration. Wow. Sometimes it's in brokenness that which creates the biggest transformation. Did you catch that phrase at the beginning of the video? You know, and it's more than just a catchy phrase at the beginning of the video. It's a grace-filled truth that we see time and time again all throughout the Bible. Take your copy of God's Word. Let's turn to Psalm chapter 51 this morning. Psalm 51. So back in 1986, J.C. Raines, Professor J.C. Raines, wrote an article for the Christian Century titled, Destiny or Choice? Or Choice or Destiny? And in the article, he dealt a lot with failure and, and the place that failure has in the Christian life and how we're then supposed to deal with that, what we're supposed to do with failure. And in one particular section of the article, he begins to deal with grief. And he says, grief refuses to flee the past just because it's gone and things have now changed. Now, we can go all day on that one because that's pretty deep, but just let that sink in for a moment. Grief doesn't flee, flee the past just because it's gone and things have now changed. Consider when we lose our innocence, when we discover that we can injure and have injured others, that the slate of our lives is not clean. Suddenly, we realize that we must travel into the future carrying not just any past, but a particular past, a past that cannot be changed. Whatever freedom means, we're not free to undo the past. This, the freedom comes in how we relate this past to our future. We can drown ourselves in regret, we can lose ourselves in nostalgia, or we can cling to these old injuries and losses. But if we do it, it's our choice. It's not our destiny. What a powerful statement. And what a wonderful reminder that Scripture never says that when it comes to grief related to our failures, that we are helplessly living underneath the bondage and the sorrow and the weight of that grief. Now... Does that mean that when we fail to meet God's righteous standard, that we're going to feel sorrow, that we're going to feel grief? Answer, yes. Does that mean that we're then left and that's all we can do is helplessly live under that condition, that state, always grieving over our past failures? Answer, no. It's exciting this morning because we're going to look at a section of Scripture that was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God on one man's heart. And it flowed out of a season in his life where he had failure after failure after failure. I mean, he lined them up, man. He really stacked up some big ones. But what we're going to see, and what I've been praying we see all week long, and what I'm praying God will do is, is he'll bring us to a season of comfort. Or, or maybe you need to be at a season of conviction this morning. Or, praise God, it may be both. But regardless of that, I pray we'll see how God was able to use that season of failure in David's life. And able to bring him through the grief of that failure to a time where he was able to glorify God in his failure. Because what I want you to understand today is this. Everybody fails. Everybody messes up. Everybody says the wrong thing at the wrong time. 
Everybody thinks the wrong thought. Everybody has an attitude that we harbor in here. No one may ever see it, but we know it's there. And we know it's in direct conflict with who God is and what he would have for our life. Everybody. But praise be to God, he doesn't leave us to grovel in our grief. No, he walks us systematically through that season of grief so that ultimately we can glorify him even in seasons of failure. What does that look like? Well, Psalm 51, I'll start with verse 1. Oh, be gracious to me, God. According to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin, for I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin. Oh, it's always before me. It's against you and you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you're right when you pass sentence. You're blameless when you judge. Indeed. I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you crushed rejoice. You turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You don't want sacrifice or I'd give it. You're not pleased with a burnt offering, for the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, O God. What beautiful poetry. How would you like to walk into your workplace or walk into your classroom every day and see this? It's called the failure wall. It's a real thing. Yeah, there's a company in, uh, I think it's in Sacramento, California, somewhere in that area. Every day when the employees walk into the main entranceway, there it is, 15 feet long, 10 feet high, with the big words across the top, the failure wall. And not only are they forced to look at it every day, but according to the company's protocol, every employee must at some point in their employment take a Sharpie, that's it, a permanent marker, and write out their failure, spell it explicitly on the failure board, and then they must sign their name to that failure. It's funny because there's a broken ping pong paddle on here. What do we do with that, Mickey? I mean, how are we, how are we supposed, to, what are we supposed to do with that? But all over this board, there are statements. Some of them are quotes. Some of them are personal statements of failure that every employee has experienced or committed. Now, how would you like to enjoy that as a part of your employment plan? Wow. Now, CE Chief Executive Jeff Steibel says his goal is not to burden his employees down with a sense of failure and, and, and a lack of commitment, whatever it was. That, that's not his goal at all. Instead, what he's trying to compel them to understand is this, that you're not going to grow from your mistakes until you own your failures. Hear what he said? You're not going to grow from your mistakes until you own your failures. It's fascinating he says that because whenever we look at verses 1 through 3, it, it seems like David's owning it, doesn't it? I mean, he uses the personal, uh, I mean, personal um, possessive pronoun five times in three verses. My rebellion, verse 1. My guilt, verse 2. My sin, verse 2. Then he repeats it again. My rebellion, verse 3. My sin, verse 3. Five times that personal possessive pronoun, first person, in three verses. So sounds to me like David's gotten kind of a hold of this thing. Like he's owning his failure. But if you're familiar with the background to this psalm, you know that that really wasn't always the case. No, if we go back to 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, we see a, a journey toward owning it. What do you mean, Brent? Well, if you go back to chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, we're told that while the kings and the armies went to battle, David decided he's going to take it easy. He's like, hey, they don't need me this time. Everything's cool. I'm going to just lay back here in the kingdom take it easy. Well, it was while doing that that David put himself in a compromised position. Up on the rooftop of the palace, which would have been the highest peak in all the city in Jerusalem outside the temple, he could see down into private areas, and what he saw drew his attention. I mean, he fixed on it, because it says that the woman was very beautiful. So it's not a casual glance on David's part, it's a whoa. 
Well, that's when things really begin to decline because he covets her. We know that because he inquires about her. And his, hey, give, i got to give it to credit to his, his, his counselors here because they give David more than he asked for. Not only did they tell her who her father was, they say, and the wife of. I mean, you can almost hear the counselor saying, hey, that's the daughter of so-and-so, and the wife of. I mean, just stressing wife for David. David didn't hear that part because he covets her. Strike one. Then he sends for her, and as she comes to him, basically forcing himself, who's going to refuse the king, right? And so there again, adultery with her, strike two. So David's already in a bad disposition. He's in a bad way. He's stacking up the failures. But yet still, he's at a place where all he's got to do is confess. All he's got to do is confess. And God will take care of it. God will absolutely forgive him of his sin. God will rectify the situation. All he's got to do is confess. But David takes the other route. Sadly, it's a route we take a lot of times too. He covers up. He covers up. He sends word to Joab, send me Uriah. Uriah comes, shows himself to be twice the man that David is. David says, Uriah, go home and visit your wife. What did Uriah do? He slept on the steps of the palace. He wouldn't even go to a bed anywhere. Next night, David says, I got a solution. I'll get him drunk. Gets him stinking drunk. What does Uriah do? Sleeps on the steps again. He would not go home. Refused all that. He was a man of integrity. And David's at wit's end. He doesn't know what to do. He tried all these different manipulation patterns. Nothing worked. And so finally, he takes that next unforgettable step of failure. Joab, I'm sending Uriah back to you. I want you to let the battle get really, really heated. I want you to have him run the front lines. And when the battle is just about to turn, pull back. Abandon him. What, I mean, Joab's not an idiot. He's a general in the army. He knows exactly what David's implying by this. This is, all, this is a homicide, nothing short. And so we're told here that when the battle was heated, Joab pulled back. The men came, the city came out. They attacked Some of the men from David's soldiers fell in the battle. Uriah the Hittite also died. There you go. That's strike three. David just committed murder. Well, Brent, David David wasn't present with that. No, no, no. David was the only reason why Uriah was where he was at, and he's the only reason why Joab pulled back. But did you notice the word also in verse 17? Also. What do you mean? There were other soldiers, men from David's soldiers, who fell in battle. Four strikes. The umpire gave him a a pass. Four strikes. Coveting, adultery, murder, on multiple occasions. But what don't we see here? Well, notice the trend. Once Bathsheba finds out that her husband is dead, it says that Bathsheba mourned for her husband. Well, yeah, she loved her husband. What David did with her was not her idea. That was not her way to try to get a leg up in the world. She wanted nothing to do with that. And so she mourned her husband. We see no mournful attitude on the part of David. In fact, as soon as she was done mourning, what does it say? David sent for her and made her his wife, and she, the child was born. But what don't we see in there? We don't see any mourning on David's part. Instead, what we see is this. The Lord considered what David had done to be evil. What am I saying? David still hadn't owned it yet. He still has not acknowledged his failures, his sin. Well, God takes the next step, chapter 12. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan uses something of a parable of sort, short one, to tell David a story, this phenomenal story about he had a rich man who had tremendous resources. You had this poor man. All he had was one little ewe lamb. One day the rich man decided he wanted that ewe lamb, and so he took that ewe lamb. And what does it say in verse 5? David was furious. Hey, as the Lord lives, this man shall die. He deserves death. And you can almost see Nathan's face kind of ease up a little bit and say, you're that man, David. You're that man. All of that, we see anger on the part of David, but no remorse, no shame, no guilt, no grief. And then notice what's next. The Lord continues to speak. I considered what you have done evil, David. And he goes back and he retells the whole event. It's not until chapter 12, verse 13, that we hear David say, I have sinned against the Lord. Now, let's do some math here. 
How long before Bathsheba would have realized that she, you know, she was pregnant as a result of, of that event? A couple of weeks, right? So for several weeks, no remorse in David, no grief for David, no sorrow for David. Well, then we fast forward a little piece, and we know that Nathan comes, and it's shortly after Nathan comes that the child is born. So that's got to be, what, close to 10 months or more? For 10 months, David knew all this. He was there. He was personally involved. No remorse, no shame, no sorrow, no grief. Why? Because he didn't own it. But after Nathan came to him with the truth, he had to own it. Why are you making such a big deal out of this, Brent? Because in our victim culture today, there are very few times that we ever see anybody truly own their failure. Oh, sure, they'll apologize. They'll give this big, eloquent speech. They'll pontificate. And I'm not just talking about politicians. I'm talking about many high-profile leaders, men and women who are looked up to on a daily basis by some of you in here and me as well, even people in, in spiritual leadership. There have been giants in the realm of spiritual leadership who have fallen as, a, as of the last couple of years. And they'll come out, and what they say, these are words of sorrow, but you don't see brokenness. You don't see grief. You don't see ownership. Hear me out. You haven't even gotten into the field of grief. You hadn't even gotten on the radar screen of grief until you first own your failure. You got to own it first. Step one. Step one. And David did. Secondly, you got to agree with God. Once you own it, you got to agree with God. Look what David says. He says, blot out my rebellion. Some translations say transgression. Same idea. Because the whole point is this. It's a, it's a point of reference or a cross that's forbidden to go beyond that. We would call it the proverbial line in the sand, right? We would say, hey, I'm drawing a line in the sand. Don't cross it. Well, you know what, folks? David, not only did he cross it, as God's drawing it, David's right behind him like a, two, like a two-year-old. Scratching it out. So that there's not a line there. David says, I now know, God, that I crossed your line. What line? Well, the Ten Commandments, nothing left, right? Don't covet. Don't, don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Just to state a few. Yeah, David went right through that boundary of God's law. David says, blot out my rebellion. Secondly, completely wash away my guilt. Now, that word guilt there is an interesting word. It's a deep word. It's, it's a more, more of an attitudinal type word. What I mean by that is it talks about depravity. In fact, in verse 5, he says, hey, I was guilty when I was born. I was conceived in sin. Now David's asking God not just to deal with him in terms of his defiant action. He's saying, deal with me in my depraved attitude. Cleanse me of my depraved attitude. I agree with you, God, that I am gripped in depravity. And I'm crying out to you, God. Number three, I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin. There it is. There's our word, right? Sin. Sin. Celebrated in modern culture, but very much deplorable to God. Sin just means to miss the mark. Chata, chata, miss the mark. Whose mark? God's. God's righteous standard. See, not only do we need to own the failure, we need to figure out and understand exactly who that failure is with and against. What do you mean, Brent? Well, verse 4, notice what he says. Against you, you only, you alone, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, hold on a minute, Brent. Uh, that's not exactly true. You read 2 Samuel eleven twelve. 12. I mean, you said Bathsheba. You said that he actually requested that she come. She was kind of sort of in a bad position, bad way. She had to do it. So you said Uriah, you said David wrote the letter. I mean, so no, I mean, but, but what he's getting at is this, that ultimately whatever he's done in action against others was done first of all in a disobedient, we'll call it maybe, defiant attitude against God, against God. See, a lot of times we look at the action, but we don't look at the attitude that compelled and prompted the action. That's what David's getting at here. And it's all about agreeing with God. Uh, you've heard me quote 1 John 1, 9 many times, I hope. If you haven't, then maybe you haven't been recently. If we confess our sin, he is faithful. 
He is righteous to cleanse us of our forgive us of our sins, cleanse us of our sins. That word confess, it's, it's a beautiful word. It's homo legale. Homo same legale word. To say the same thing. It's to basically to say the same thing about sin that God says about sin. And specifically, our sin. And so David, when he owned it, had to, hey, he said he had to agree with God that what he had done, although absolutely deplorable in how he had treated others, was ultimately in defiance and disobedience against God. He had, done, he had to agree to that. Now, I know you're struggling with that, so I want to share this lengthy quote from J.J. Um, uh, Stewart that says this. All wrong done, done to our neighbor is wrong done to one created in the image of God. All, um, excuse me, my iPad slipped back. All tempting of our neighbor to evil is taking the part of Satan against God and, so far as in us lies, defeating God's good purpose of grace toward him. All wounding of another, whether in person or property, in body or soul, is a sin against the goodness of God. Because you see, a lot of times when we focus on the individual, that we're acting against, that we're speaking against, that we're thinking against, we'll say, they, they get what they deserve. They had it coming. They had it coming to them. Hey, I knew them in school. They picked on, they bullied, they mistreated. They had it coming to them. Hey, they've cheated so many people out of their finances. They've been such a horrible investor. We have a tendency, I mean, for instance, what was it, two weeks ago, Bernie Madoff died. We all remember Bernie, right? Yeah, one of, the biggest, one of the biggest Ponzi schemes in history. Ripped off billions of dollars. I wonder how many people mourn that death. You know, we look at somebody like that and <laughs> Bernie got what he had coming to him. <laughs> We've got to agree with God that what I've done in my failure, although it may have been done to someone, ultimately the offense is to God. Why? Because they're created in his image. They're creating his image. That's the reason why I'll tell you in a heartbeat, it doesn't matter what skin color person is, how much pigmentation they have in their skin. At the heart of that individual is the one who is created in the image of God. And so whenever we speak against, we're in essence speaking against God. So I'm telling you here today, if you have not grieved a past failure, you either haven't owned it. And if you've owned it, then you haven't agreed with God about it yet because once you agree with God... Then you're ready to go to that next step. It's the only step you can take unless you're just going to keep on living with grief. And the whole goal of today is to help you work through that season of grief. So what is the step, Brent, for crying out loud? Get there. You've been hammering us for the last 20 minutes. I'm getting there. Chill out. I'm getting there. I'm going to release you in a minute. Hey, we do exactly what David did. We appeal to God's grace. We appeal to God's grace. And he does it in a threefold manner. How did he agree with God? In a threefold manner. Rebellion. Deploy, depravity, sin. Now look what he does. Purify me with hyssop, and I'll be clean. Oh, that's a great word. The word means to purge. But, but there's more to it than that. You know, because we know that that purification process via hyssop required something very, very special and costly. Can anybody tell me what it was? His blood. His blood. In the ceremonial cleansing that would have involved hyssop, blood would have been required. Because what would have happened is the priest would have taken sacrificial lambs, beautiful, perfect lambs. And they would have sacrificed those lambs, and they would have captured the blood from those lambs in a basin. And they would have dipped that hyssop, which is something of a grass or a plant, in that. And they would have rubbed it across the altar, the mercy seat, in the various places. And then ultimately they would have sprinkled it on the people as a demonstration and demonstration and the validation that their sins had been covered and atoned for, meaning that it cost a life. That's exactly what the writer of Hebrews says, that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So David's going straight to the heart of the matter. He says, first of all, I know it's costly, God, but I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. I'm asking you to purify me with hyssop. Descend me, God. Secondly, Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Well, there's a great word. It's the envisioner of the launderer who, who would take laundry, and if you will, go with me back before we had our nice washers and dryers to basically where it was a little elbow grease you had to use. Think about old westerns maybe, where they would be cleaning. They'd have that, that, that wash um, 
board, that rough board, and they would take and they would rub it down that board. In some cases, they would take another object and rub it down it, and they would keep rubbing that water through and rubbing that water through. And they'd take that old lye soap, which was some stout stuff, man. It must have been good because they outlawed it. But they'd take that old lye soap, and they'd rub it in, and all those stains, and all that grit and grime, and they would rub and rub it, and boom, beautiful white garment restored. David says, hey, Lord, put me on the washboard of your, of your righteousness and rub and wine and bind and get it all out, God. I want it all gone. Take it all out, please. Number three, turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. See, there's an idea present in some ways, maybe metaphorically in a sense, but in Scripture where there's a role being taken, there's a record being kept. A ledger of sort. All of our failures, all of our sins, all of our shortcomings. Whether it's a thought that never leaves our mouth, or maybe it's a word we couldn't grab and bring back. Or even deeper, an attitude that we've harbored that we know is clearly not of Christ. And there it is on that righteous ledger. Just stacking up, stacking up, stacking up. And David is saying, Lord, after cleansing me of all that unrighteousness, I'm asking you by your grace to blot out the record. Guess what, folks? That's grace. Because God, as a righteous God that he is, holy in every aspect of his existence, has every right, every right to hold on to every wrong, every fault and every failure. He has every right. But you know what we know based upon what David did? He won't do it. I go back to 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse. Think of it this way. Just imagine you're in a courtroom, and whether you believe in Satan or not, just, you know, humor me for a moment. So you're in a courtroom. It's you. God's the judge. Satan is the DA. He's, he's the prosecutor. Coach calls your name. So-and-so, come forward, please. You come forward. And the devil, I mean, you ain't hardly stepped forward good yet. And here comes Satan, the accuser. He says, Your Honor, I would like to submit evidence number one, this record of all the wrongs committed. And God, look at this. He lied. He deceived. He cheated. He stole. He murdered. He bare false witness. He dishonored his father and mother. Man, Your Honor, I can go on and on and on. I just want to be sensitive to the court's time. I would like to submit this to go into his permanent record as a proof of his guilt. Guilty, Your Honor, guilty. God reaches, grabs that, that record sheet. But before he can get to take a look at it, the defense attorney shows up. Guess who that is? He said, Your Honor, may I see that before you glance over it, please? Sure, sure, counselor, here. It's Jesus the righteous. He says, Your Honor, unless I'm missing something here, there's nothing on this. And he hands it back to the righteous judge, and the righteous judge sees that all that was written down had been erased. And he declares, Innocent. By the blood of the Lamb. Wow. Hey, folks, that's what it means to appeal to the grace of God. And that's what David's doing right here. He's saying, please blot it out. I want no record of any of this, of any failure that I've committed. That's how you move through the season of grief in regards to failure. You ain't done yet. Oh, baby, he's just getting started. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. That's a powerful word, create. It's a word, bara. That's a rare word in Scripture. We don't see it used very often because it's such a powerful word. It's a word that we find, first of all, all the way back in Genesis 1. Guess what's going on in Genesis 1? There was nothing, then there was. Ex nihilo, everything. What are you getting at, Brent? I'm saying that the word bara is used to represent God creating everything from nothing. The word was used two more times in creation. One, I believe, in reference to God creating life in the general sense. The other one, later on in verse 27, where God says, So God created man. So this idea of create is David's way of saying, I don't want David 1.2. I don't, David 1. I don't want David 1.3. I don't want David 1.3. 
I don't even want David 2.0. I want David 3.0. What are you getting at, Brent? Well, he keeps going. It's a, it's a trifecta again. He's saying, I am begging you to perform nothing short of a miracle. I don't want to refurb. I don't want to redo. I don't want to make over. I want brand new. 3.0. Keeps on going. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. I don't have time to deal with that a lot, but just suffice it to say, he's not saying that the Holy Spirit's been taken from him. Otherwise, he wouldn't say, do not do that. He's speaking in hyperbole here. What he's saying is, close the gap. He knows that his failure has created a separation of sorts between himself and intimacy with God. He still knows God is present. He still knows God is working in his life. But there's a strain on the relationship. And he's saying, God, take down all the strains. Remove all the barriers. Close up the gap. Because I want to sense your presence as close as the next breath I breathe. That's what he's getting at right here. He knows there's a distance there. And then third, 3.0, restore the joy of your salvation. Uh, that's, that's maybe one of my favorite verses in this whole psalm. You know why? Because he didn't say restore the joy of my salvation. He didn't say get me back to where I was at. Get me back to, get me back to, to even God and I'll go at it again. No, no, no. Remember, he said I want, a, I want a new heart. I want a brand new heart. Remember, he said, first of all, I want a renewed sense of your spirit. I want to know you there. And then third, now he's saying, hey, restore the joy of... You almost missed it. I thought it was pretty obvious. Good job at home, by the way. Restore the joy of your salvation. Yes. Because God's salvation is perfect and pure. It's awesome. Lastly, you don't want a sacrifice, or I'd give it to you. You're not pleased with the burnt offering. This is a Jew saying this? Has he lost his mind? The Levitical system was still in, in very much active there were sheep being slaughtered every day. There were goats being slaughtered every day. The Levitical process was active, especially during Passover. Has David lost his mind? No. No, I'd say for the first time maybe in his life, he's gained the mind of Christ. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, O oh God. You know what that says? That for those of us who find ourselves in a season where we're grieving over past failures, you thought you'd conquered them. You thought you had removed yourself from the feeling of guilt and shame as a result of, and whatever it was. I mean, if it was a word you said you shouldn't have said, if it was something you've done that you shouldn't have done, if it was an attitude that you continue to hold on to towards someone that you know is not of Christ... But for those of us who are walking through a season where the grief of failure is still holding us down in bondage and slavery, what you need to know is this. The sacrifice that God is looking for is that, first of all, you own the failure. Secondly, you agree with God about that failure. Third, you appeal to his grace so that you can give him that broken spirit and that humble heart, and he won't despise it. He'll embrace it. He'll embrace it. And he'll release it from the shame and the guilt. And he will redeem it to his righteous pleasures. Wow. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Amazing Grace. Anybody seen that movie Amazing Grace? It was based on the life of, of John Newton. You got William Wilberforce. In this particular point, William Wilberforce is over here to your right. You got John Newton on the left. John Newton was a great friend of Wilberforce, but he was also his older pastor. So he had grown up under his teaching to a great degree. Well, as you may know from history, Wilberforce is going to be that major force to annihilate the transatlantic slave trade. He, he had committed his life to totally doing away with slave trade. And man, was he passionate. But he needed some help. And he knew that John Newton could give it to him. Because John Newton himself had been a slave trader captain. He had been on a ship. He'd been the one moving the slaves back and forth from where they were taken, uh, taken into slavery, brought over and sold. He knew good and well what went on with that. And so Wilberforce comes to him in this particular point of the movie, and he says, We're, hey, man, I need your help. I'm going to annihilate slavery, but I need your help. I need you to write down everything. Everything? John said, yeah, everything. I need the names of ships. I need the names of ports. I need the names of people, if you remember. I need the price that was paid. I need everything that you can possibly give me in regards to your involvement with the slave trade. And John Newton shook his head in shame. 
said, I can't do that, Wilbur. William, I, I, I can't bring myself to do that. He said, you don't understand that every day the voice of 20,000 ghosts haunts my mind. No doubt representing the slaves that he had moved back and forth across the ocean. He said, I just can't bring myself to do that. Well, Wilberforce would not be deterred, and he, pres he pressed on. And toward the end of the movie, he comes back to Newton. As you'll notice, Newton looks a lot different now. Time has passed. It obviously hadn't been real good to him. Hair's all grown out and mangly looking. He's also lost his sight. Can't see. So he's kind of just looking in the direction of William Wilberforce as Wilberforce speaks. William lets him know that we're really close. We're right on the edge of the abolishment of slavery, totally doing away with it. And before he can finish his statement, Newton finds him, and he puts something on his chest. He said, use this. We're, we're before he says, hold on a minute. What is it? No, use that. He said, well, what is this? He said, that is the names. That, that, that are the people. Those are the people. Those are the ports. Those are the prices. That's everything you need. Please use that. And then he makes this statement. He says, my mind is failing me, and I can't remember everything that I once did remember, but I do remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. Wow. What a statement to remember. I am a great sinner, and Christ, he is the great which is why I tell you today, if the burden and the shame of guilt for past failures continues to weigh heavy on you and hold you hostage, it doesn't have to be that way. David has given us a guide for working through the guilt and the shame, relinquishing the grief of failure so that we might glorify God. And it all begins where Christ finished. Did you hear me? It all begins where Christ finished. What do you mean, Brent? Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 5. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, yeah, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, your salvation is not based upon you earning merit. Salvation is not based upon you getting to a place where you've done enough good things to cancel out all the bad things. When I said a ledger earlier, salvation in Christ is not about the ledger of bad things being beside the ledger of good things and you doing your best to make sure the good side outweighs the bad side. Because according to the Word of God, if there's one thing on the bad side, it's going to totally wipe out everything you possibly put on the good side. And at that point, you are in a position of helplessness. Praise be to God, Paul says, that while we were still helpless at the right time, according to God's perfect plan, Christ died for the ungodly. I can identify with that one. Man, praise be to God, Christ stepped into my helpless state. And he did what only he could do. He performed a miracle. Didn't David ask for a miracle? Yeah, he asked for David 3.0. He said, I want a new heart. I want a new heart. I don't want the heart of flesh. I want the heart of righteousness. I want the heart of Christ. So if you're here this morning and you're struggling with grief and shame and guilt over past failures, you can't get out from under the burden and the weight of that, then it might well be that you're still under it because there's one that is oppressing you. He is called the deceiver, the liar, Satan himself. And he would like nothing more for you to enter eternity with that guilt because that will be judgment, sin, and hell. What it's going to be. But Christ the righteous stands ready and waiting, waiting for us to own it. You got to own it. Waiting for us to agree with God that one violation of His law is like thousands of violations of His law. And waiting for us to appeal to His grace. Hey, if we'll just appeal to that grace, confessing our sin, confessing our belief in Him as being Savior and Lord. And committing our life to him, that starts the journey. Are you on the journey this morning? Are you? Because some of us are. And we're, yet we're still battling guilt, aren't we? 
We're still, we're still struggling with, with, with the past failures. Brent, I don't know what to do. All that happened before I even became a Christian. Brent, I don't know what to do. I followed the formula. I've confessed my sin. I know that God's faithful and just, but I still feel the burden of that failure. I don't know what to do. You've got to give it to God. You've got to truly and completely cry out and say, God, create a clean heart in me. God, wash me, make me clean. God, restore the joy. Because notice what Paul says moving forward. Hey, how much more then, since we've been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from, his, from wrath? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? Yes. Yes. And because we're saved by his life, David says there's some things that should totally occupy us. Number one, I will teach the sinners, the rebellious, transgressors, your ways. I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will return to you. Now this isn't some kind of a lecture thing where David's going to go out and he's going to evangelize, he's going to preach. Everybody going to hell. Everybody's sin. Everybody, that's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about is living a grace-filled life where every interaction he has, every action he undertakes is saturated with grace. He is going to live a life that represents God. And we do that in Christ. So the first thing we do, believers, to show we're out from under the shame and the grief of past failures is we live a grace-filled life of, of faith in Christ, believing he has indeed, not just forgiven us, cleansed, blotted out. And then secondly, notice what he says. Hey, if you'll save me from my blood guiltness, God of my salvation, my tongue will sing your righteousness, my lips will declare your praise. That means that when I have the opportunity, I talk to people about the good God. I talk to people about Jesus. I let them know who he is, what he's done, and what that now means for us. I am serious with the gospel. And the way we praise him is daily. We get into his word, right? So that his word gets into us, and we made it so easy. This week, we're passionate about prayer. All week long, we're going to be passionate about prayer. Matthew 9, 35 through 38, one of my favorite sets of texts in regards to how Jesus was able to get his disciples to see the urgency and sense the urgency and act with urgency. So we go to God's word as a means to dealing with the guilt and the shame. And then we live in community. You want to know the easiest target for Satan? Somebody, what's the easiest target for Satan? Someone alone. And actually, it's more, I mean, it's more that believer who's alone. When a believer isolates himself or herself away from community, man, a bullseye pops up on you like you have never seen in your life. And Satan says, bingo, I got him. Got him right where I want him. And you know what COVID has done? COVID has separated out so many from the community of faith. Whether that be in the large setting, and I'm going to tell you, this large setting is not enough. You need to be in small group. You need to be in community, connect groups. Why? Because that's where life-changing community happens. That's where life-changing ministry happens. That's where life-changing truth is taught. And in that way, we are, com we are confronted with sin. We're comforted in struggles and hardship. We're held accountable by one another. You need to be in community. You need to be in a small group. You need to be in a connect group. Well, what will all this result in, Brent? Praise God. Release from the grief of failure. Release from the guilt and shame of failure. And that's exactly what I've been praying for you all week long. I said, God, as we walk through this beautiful poetry of brokenness and restoration, God, I'm praying for two things. I'm praying, first of all, you'll confront us in that area or those areas of life that we have never agreed with you about. We hadn't agreed with you about them, but they're not of you. Secondly, oh God, I pray that you will comfort us as we are walking through this season of grief, trying to follow your guidance and leadership in trying to redeem that failure and be reconciled to you. So that's my prayer for you this morning. And whatever that looks like, in a moment we're going to sing the song that is very much applicable to this. I'm not going to be standing here looking at you. That's so awkward, by the way. 
I'm going to be down here to receive you. If you need me to pray with you, I'll hit my knees with you right here, and so I will pray. If you need me to give you some guidance on salvation, I'll be glad to sit around here. My friend Barry's right over here. Barry's chaplain. Barry's very capable. Barry's very, he's ready. He's available. We've got some deacons right here close. If there's an outpouring of the Spirit, don't you dare sit there wondering. Don't you dare sit there being held back by shame. Today is the chain-breaking day. And that's what we're about to sing about. So let me pray for us. And let's sing and let's celebrate Jesus. Lord God, thank you that your word made it so clear. That even though David delayed, and, and, and he did delay for quite a while, actually. Even though, in, in some sense, he, he, he covered up when he should have confessed. Even though all of that caused him to, to be in, in a very compromised position. Very compromised. Even in all that, you came to him. You pursued him. And although you revealed his sin, ultimately you pursued him for the purpose of of forgiving him of that sin and restoring him to right relationship with you. And God, I, I just, I, I'm praying that you're pursuing today, that the hound of heaven is working among his people today, and that you are passionately going after that one or those ones who, if they died right now in their current spiritual condition, that they'd be destined for eternity in hell. It's not your heart. So, Holy Father, draw them to yourself. And first of all, convicting them about their sin. Secondly, of convincing them, helping them to know that you, Jesus, are Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then third, to them committing and confessing. Confessing that you, Jesus, are the Savior of our soul and that committing that you are the Lord of, you're Lord of all. Lord, do a miracle right now, please. And do a miracle in us as well so that we no longer continue to, to try to sh just move through this season of grief as a result of failure, but yet that we would relinquish it. We would, we would own it first. We would agree with you second. Then we would appeal to your marvelous grace to absolutely remove it. That there wouldn't even be a small iota of any resemblance of, of the writing down of our sin. Please, do a miracle among us today like only you can do. So all glory and honor would come to you. Break the chains so we can truly declare our sins gone. Right here, right now in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's stand together and celebrate Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here will be Just a reminder that this Thursday, 12 o'clock, we're going to try to be at the gazebo across the road in front of the high school at tw- a little before 12. It's National Day of Prayer. I could care less what somebody said back then. We just need to pray. So we want to gather around the flagpole that still represents our nation, and we're going to pray passionately for everything from political leaders all the way down through all the different ones who are involved in that daily process of keeping us safe to our nation, praying desperately for our nation. So if you're available around that 12, we'll be done quickly so we can get you back to your work, hopefully give you a chance to grab a bite as well. So please feel free to come join us. If the weather doesn't permit us there, then we'll just come in here. We've got, you know, that'll be plan B. So it's going to happen. One way or the other, we're going to be praying this coming Thursday. So I'd love for you to come and join us on that. I meant to ask you beforehand, but hey, Mickey, you mind coming up here and praying for us, brother, and dismissing us? I guess we have to borrow Mike's, Mark's mic. I don't know if this one's even on, is it? Sorry, technicalities. Not the fault of your set or the TV station, so just stand by. you got to be old enough to know what that means, too, by the way. <laughs> Heavenly Father, God, we love you, and we just thank you, God, that you are a restoring Father, God of hope, righteousness. Father, we are called to pray for our leaders, those that are in I just thank you for the honor, God, that you've given us as your children to be able to pray for our leaders. God, as we leave this building, mission, pray to honor you with our leaders. God, I thank you for your love for us. Help us to bring honor to you in all we do.